John 13, verse 1 to 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all, of all you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table as Jesus side at Jesus side so Simon Peter mentioned motion to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking so that disciple leaning back against Jesus said to him Lord who is it Jesus answered it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it so when he had dipped the morsel he gave it to Jesus the son of Iscariot then after he had taken the morsel Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? What you are going to do, do quickly. No, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money back, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. This is the word of God. Well, let's pray as we come to God's word. Father, as we come here this morning, we have been inundated this week, even this weekend, with all kinds of thoughts and voices and concerns. And so, Lord, we do pray that you may clear our minds, our hearts, and that we may hear the voice of God as he speaks to us through the Bible. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. 
What a person does on their last day before they die says a great deal about that person. For instance, Socrates uh, was sentenced to death by the Athenians in 399 BC. He drank a cup of tea with hemlock. He was stoic, he was cheerful, he was speaking to his friends. He said to Crito, his friend, we owe a chicken to your brother, please pay it and don't forget. He lay down and died. Joseph Parker was executed in the USA for rape and murder in 1999. He asked for three Burger King Whoppers with fries, milkshake, and ice cream. His attorney said that he asked for this meal because the slogan, the Burger King slogan, have it your way, was the motto of his life. Well, what we have here in chapter 13 is the last day in the normal life of Jesus. It's the day, the night before the Passover. And you remember, he died at the Passover. So though we're only in chapter 13 in John's Gospel, which has 21 chapters, we are here at the night before his death. It's his last day. And as I said, what a person does on their last day says a great deal about them. So what we have here is Jesus. He knows it's his last day. What does he do? He spends his time with his disciples. He loves them to the end. He washes their feet. In fact, John chapter 13 is quite a critical passage to understand who Jesus is and why he came and what we ought to do as a consequence. So that's what we're going to find as we work through this chapter. And it really will be a great help to me if you do have your Bibles open, if you have the church Bible, we are on page 900. Let me unpack the passage under two headings. Number one, the washing of feet, and the second, the coming of night. But let me just go down one side road. When we talk about Jesus, when we talk about death, when we talk about Christian living, we need to understand that what we are actually talking about is supernatural. Notice verse 20, Jesus tells us that whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So Jesus was sent. So he's talking about God the Father. He didn't just appear out of nowhere. He wasn't just a a passing light uh, that came about. No, the Father sent him. Uh, He came here as the Son of God, God in the flesh. So what we're talking about here is supernatural. You're not going to learn about this on IT or social media. No, here we have the internal, infinite, supernatural God. God the Father sends his Son into space and time to come and rescue us. You'll also notice verse 2. There's an evil power. There's an evil supernatural person called Satan. So verse Satan, we read that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Notice verse 27. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. So what we're talking about here is not just morals and ethics. We're not just talking about Christian values or Christian culture. We're not just talking about Christian positive thinking or motivational thinking. No, what we're talking about here is supernatural. God is real. God is powerful. The devil is real. The devil is powerful. The devil has real power. It is limited power because God has greater power But nonetheless, there's a real God and there's a real Satan. So what we are talking about here is not just ordinary living. We're talking about something that is positively supernatural. We're talking about eternal matters. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about God and Satan. So let's have a look and dig into our first principle, the washing of feet. And let me read again verse 1 to 5, which forms the heart of the passage. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from the Father and was going back to the Father, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Now, it's a well-known passage to most of us. Most of us will know this passage, uh, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And he's obviously modeling to us how we ought to treat one another as members of the family. We all kind of get it. Have a look at verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put it in his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. I then, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So we all kind of get it. It's quite obvious. Jesus is modeling how we ought to treat one another. But what I think we don't get is verse 1, which really is the key to the passage. Notice verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So what is happening here in chapter 13 is closely related, verse 1, to the hour, the hour Jesus talks about, the hour when he will depart, meaning his death. So the story of the washing of the feet must have something to do with the death of Christ. You get the same thing, verse 7. Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. After what? Well, after his death, you will understand what this washing is all about. So the, so the washing of the feet is not only modeling to us servant leadership and how we ought to treat one another. It's actually a picture. It's a parable of what Jesus will do on the cross. It's an explanation of the meaning of the cross. It's an explanation of what the cross will achieve. So let's have a look at that, and uh, let's pick up three things that we can learn from the washing of feet. The first thing that that is quite obvious there in verse 1 is the extraordinary love of Christ. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus knew that his hour of death had come. 24 hours later, he would be on the cross And so what does he do? I think that's a good question. What does he do in the last day? What would you do in your last day if you knew that you were dying? Well, what does Jesus do? Well, he doesn't eat three Burger Whopper, Burger Burger King Whoppers. No, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. He loved them by serving them. He loved them by washing their feet. Now, try to imagine the scene. It really would have been quite awkward and embarrassing, this whole scene, if you understand the cultural context. The cultural context is when you have a special meal of this nature. It's a special meal. It's a special occasion. You would normally have a slave, and it's normally the lowest slave of the lowest who would wash your feet. Your feet were dusty and dirty. There were no motor cars. There was no how train. You would walk everywhere. And it wasn't just dust and grime. There were animals. And animals do things. So you only had the lowest of the lowest slave who would wash feet. In fact, some Jewish teachers taught that even Jewish slaves were not required to wash feet. Only Gentile slaves. That's us. So the unspoken tension in, 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 in the room, because there are no slaves, is who's going to wash their feet? That's what you do. That's what you normally do on these special occasions. Who's going to wash my feet? No doubt the disciples would have been most happy, or more than happy, to have washed Jesus' feet. But peers don't wash each other's feet. So you can imagine. It's not for me to wash your feet. I mean, in fact, if anything, you should be washing my feet. I mean, that's the awkwardness of of the moment. It's awkward. It's embarrassing. It comes out in Simon Peter's question, verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? 
Meaning, this is not the normal order of things. This is not the natural order of things. Verse 8, you shall never wash my feet. He's embarrassed. He's indignant. Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus, it just isn't right. I mean, you are overthrowing the normal, the normal balance of how things are done. You see, verse 7, just as the disciples couldn't understand why their Lord and Master had to die on the cross, so they couldn't understand why their Lord and Master had to wash their feet. What am I doing? What I am doing, verse 7, you do not understand now. But afterwards, after my death, you will understand. You see, what we have here in the washing of the feet is exactly what happens on the cross, We see the extraordinary humility of Christ. We see the extraordinary love of Christ. Remember John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. So up to this this point in time, we've seen seen the, the grand universal scale of the love of Christ. But now it's personal. It's individual. It's Jesus washing each one of my feet. It's a little bit like watching, imagine yourself watching the sun set over the sea. And as you watch it set, you can see the rays of the sun spread over all of the planet that you can see. But in a special way, you feel the rays of the sun on you. It's personal. Now, it's good to remember that as Jesus personally washes each foot You see, there are times when we all go through deep waters, very deep waters. We sung about that in that lovely, lovely song earlier on from Psalm 46. And we need to remember at those times that Jesus' love is personal, it's individual. I can remember one time, it's happened many times, but on one occasion... I was feeling especially depressed and discouraged and under pressure. I went outside, took a walk, looked up at the stars. And the thought that just repeatedly washed over me, it just just came to my mind, is he died for me. He died for me. He died for me. That's how much he loves me. And I went back inside with, with hope, with courage to go on another day. The surgeon Richard Seltzer writes this, and I quote, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been cut. She will be thus from now on. To remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself. He and this distorted mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks, will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. Unmindful, he bends bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers to show that their kiss still works, end of quote. And Jesus twists his head, his hands, his feet, so that he can take the thorns and the nails that we deserve. We see here the love of Christ, the extraordinary love of Christ. Second thing we notice here, we're going to go a little bit over time this morning, so please forgive me. The second thing we notice here, from the washing of feet, is that the physical washing is really pointing to a spiritual washing. Just as you find it throughout John's Gospel, 
you find the same kind of uh, rhythm, the same kind of uh, style. So when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he says, I am the bread of life. When Jesus uh, gives sight, uh, John chapter 9, to the blind man, he says, I am the light of the world. So, he, so here the washing of the feet point to a greater truth, the washing of sin. So Jesus goes around the room, extraordinary, the master, washing each of the disciples' feet. No doubt they're all stunned into silence. Don Carson, in his commentary on John's Gospel, says, I quote, There is no example in either Jewish or Greco-Roman sources of a superior washing the feet of an inferior. Let's pick it up, verse 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. Now, if you know Peter, if you know the Gospels, Peter can never be accused of being a wallflower. You will never die wondering what Peter thought. All right? Um, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. He's washed everyone's feet. Peter speaks up. Uh, he says, you shall never wash my feet. But Peter's only thinking spiritually. Uh, so he's only thinking physically. It's unacceptable that you wash my feet. But Jesus is thinking spiritually. And notice there, verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. You see, our ultimate problem is not filthy feet. Our, problem, our ultimate problem is filthy hearts. That's our real problem. Unless the Lamb of God can take away your sin and washes away your sin, you can have no part of him. None. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, he becomes a criminal, he becomes a slave, he submits himself to slaughter on a cross so that he can rescue us, so that he can wash us clean from all our moral filth and guilt. Now, you don't need to speak out aloud, but will you for a moment just try to think about the three greatest sins that you are totally, totally ashamed of. So I'll give you a moment. What are the three greatest sins, if you think back, that you are so ashamed of? Not sure about you, but all kinds of thoughts, lots of thoughts go through my mind. That's why Jesus came. He came to wash you from those sins. And the only way was for him to be slaughtered on a cross and to shed his blood to wash away the sin. There was a great hymn writer in the 1800s called Robert, Robert Lowry, and I'm going to ask Bronwyn to take the words and give us some new music to the song. Lovely words. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the washing of the feet is really just a picture. It's a parable. So it's a parable of how Jesus has really come to wash our hearts, our minds, our souls from all that dirt, that garbage, that filth. Verse 8, if I, if, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So here's the catch. Jesus cannot help you one bit, not one bit, if you don't realize that you're dirty. So the first step in becoming a Christian is not being a good person, is not saying your prayers, going to church. Those are good things, but that's not the first step in becoming a Christian. The first step in becoming a Christian is to realize you are unbelievably filthy before the holy God of heaven. You're covered with filth. Your thoughts, your actions, your words, your motives. You're ashamed 
of the things you've thought and said. And that actually is the problem with most people, why they do not come to Christ. I don't think it's because they have problems with the supernatural. I don't think it's because they have problems with the evidence. I think the evidence is perfectly clear. The problem is this. People say, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm only human. I know I need a bit of spit and polish here and there, but I'm, but I'm, a, I'm a clean person. I know I need to try a bit more, but, but I'm really okay. Well, my dear friend, if that's what you're saying, you are exactly like Peter, who's saying, you shall never wash my feet. It's pride, it's arrogance. I'm okay as I am. I don't need, need Jesus to, to wash me. I don't need some preacher to tell me what to do. Are you actually saying that I'm useless? Are you actually saying that I can't wash myself? Are you actually treating me like a child? Do you think I'm stupid? That's why people don't come to Christ. Because they don't want to admit, I'm dirty. I need somebody outside of myself to wash me. And Jesus says, verse 8, if you don't admit that you are unbelievably, irretrievably filthy and spiritually broken and covered with shame and guilt, I can never wash you. New Year's resolutions don't, don't crack it. You need to first admit your filth. Third thing we can learn here about the washing of feet is it's really a template for us, as was the obvious point, of how we ought to operate as believers. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So it's not only a parable of the cross and what Christ will do for us on the cross in cleansing us, but it's a template, it's an example of Christian di discipleship, of how we ought to behave as the followers of Christ. Paul actually fleshes it out. Have a look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, page 984 in your church Bibles. Paul fleshes out this idea of foot washing in this lovely portion. In fact, the whole chapter is magnificent. But have a look at chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Have you got it there? Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen, ho chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now, why do we need to bear with each other? Why do we need to forgive one another? Why? Because we're all broken, filthy people. Even after you become a Christian, you still get it wrong. Well, so I, I certainly get it wrong. That's why we have to bear with each other. That's why we have to forgive each other. Remember what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, it's not the verses in the Bible I don't understand that worry me. It's the verses in the Bible I do understand that worry me. I'm well aware of my age and my era, but I do have a growing aversion to social media. You see, I think it's very hard, verse 12, to be compassionate, kind, and humble with virtual people. I think it's very hard to bear with one another when all you need to do is delete. I think it's hard to wash someone else's feet when they're only virtual feet. It doesn't kind of work, does it? In one way or the other, we all struggle with relationships at work, at home, in our marriage, with our extended family. Well, actually, here's the key, isn't it? Here's the key, and it's the hardest key you can find. We are to serve one another. We are to put other people first. You need to know, I find that extremely difficult because I'm selfish and self-centered by nature. I do not find that easy. That's why you and I need the Holy Spirit every single day so that we can put other people first, so that we can serve other people. Here's the building block to Christian community. 
to a Christian marriage, to a Christian family. We serve one another. We think of others before we think of ourselves. Let me give you a couple of, couple, couple of examples of how we are to wash the feet of one another. You may be a senior person in your company, in your corporate. Well, there's, there's a very new staff member, a junior, perhaps an intern, who's really drowning. It's quite obvious. Wouldn't it be great if you spend one or two hours a week helping them so that they don't drown? You come home from work, you're exhausted, you're frustrated, perhaps you're angry. You have to put it all aside, play games with the kids, wash up after supper and make your wife a special hot drink. That's what it means. You have deadlines at work, you have deadlines in your studies, but you're willing to take your helper at home to the local clinic and queue with her for two hours to get her medication. That's what it means. You see, it's those who have been humbled at the cross who become the raw material for community. All right, let's quickly have a look. Five minutes. The coming of the night. We've looked at the washing of feet. Let's quickly have a look at the coming of the night. Now, hopefully you read John 13 before you came this morning. It really is helpful to me if you can read the passage we're going to look at. Next week we're going to look at the end of chapter 13, chapter 14. So do read that before next Sunday. Uh, But as you read chapter 13, there's a kind of an intimacy here that you almost don't find anywhere else in the Gospels, but there's also the shadow, because there's a traitor amongst you. So we picked that up again, verse 2, during supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Verse 11, for he knew, Christ knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, it's important to understand that, that, that Judas wasn't just a helpless victim or a helpless pawn in Satan's hands. No, there's a progression. There's a pipeline. Perhaps for three years he had held Jesus at arm's length. Perhaps for three years Judas had been greedy and stealing money and corrupt and deceitful. Sounds like the Sunday Times. When you consistently resist Christ and his word, remember, it gives an opportunity, it gives a window for the devil to act. When you close your heart to the light consistently, repeatedly, over and over and over and over again, don't be surprised when you become the servant of darkness. Actions have consequences. So he is betrayed. Verse 21, we won't read that portion. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then we have the betrayal of Judas. We have Simon Peter wanting to know who will betray him. We have the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, uh, asking Jesus and Jesus saying, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. You'll notice there, verse 21, that that the betrayal doesn't take Jesus by surprise, but he is deeply affected by it. He's troubled in spirit. In a sense, like Jesus, we should always be troubled in spirit and agitated when there is sin, when there's evil, when there's injustice, when there's abuse, when there's racism when there's exploitation. It should trouble us. It should anger us. There's a place for righteous indignation as a Christian. That doesn't mean you fly off the handle. But we should be angry with injustice. We should be angry with abuse. When Jesus tells John... He says, it's he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it, gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? Do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. So it's quite possible that, 
that when John asked him that question, who is it, that Jesus spoke quietly and all the other disciples were talking, chattering away. They didn't hear and only John heard and perhaps he was too shocked to react. Notice verse 26. There's a, there's a hint here. So I wonder if there isn't a hint here of Christ's final offer of grace to Judas. It's he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So in the Palestinian culture, and to a certain extent it's true of our culture, when you give before the meal, you give a morsel, just a titbit. you the host, you give a titbit to to someone, it's a mark of special favor. Like when you have a bra, you have bourrevors, and your close friend is standing next to you. The wives don't know this, by the way, but um, <laughs> you give a little piece to your buddy before you take the bourrevors to your wife. <laughs> so it's almost as if this is a last attempt by Jesus to win Jesus. Judas with love and with grace and for just a moment his destiny hangs in the balance for one last time three years he's been with Jesus and there's one last time he stretches out his hand but no the moment passes perhaps there was a time when Judas's heart was soft and open to Christ but there comes a time when you've said no so often that your heart is hard and you no longer hear and you no longer respond and he turns away into darkness verse 30 so after receiving the morsel of bread he immediately went out and it was night two comments and we close there's a there's a bit of a disturbing element here when you look at this group of disciples who've been with Jesus for 12 years, that it's possible to claim to be a disciple of Christ, but not to be a proper disciple. Not everyone who's part of the visible church of Christ is part of the invisible church of Christ. Remember, G Judas saw all the miracles. G Judas heard all the teaching. Judas saw that Jesus was God in the flesh, and yet he refused to believe in fact, Judas' feet were washed by Jesus. He had all the privileges of being part of the family of God, the people of God, and yet his heart remained unwashed. Jesus washed his feet, but his heart remained unwashed. It's quite disturbing, isn't it? Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. So, my dear friend, examine yourself. Examine your heart, and in particular... You need to have come to that point where you have realized, I am a filthy wretch. Unless God has mercy on me, I am lost. He tells us that the road to hell you'll find at the very gates of heaven. Last comment. In the midst of the sin, the evil Satan, the betrayal, the denial by Peter, it's quite obvious that Jesus never loses control. Never. Have a look at verse 3. It gives us one indication. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. His purposes, his sovereignty would not be thwarted, even by Satan himself, even by the betrayal, even by the denial, even by the desertion. It's crucial that we remember that. There are times we go through deep waters. We seem to be the focus of Satan's attack. We need to remember God is in control. It may not look like it. it. certainly didn't look like it in chapter 13. But he is in control. In fact, God can use sin and evil for his purposes. In the economy of God, even our sins and evil, which is not from God, God can use for his purposes because he's absolutely in control. So don't give up. So let me close. The question for all of us is where are we going to live? Are we going to live in the light or the darkness? Are we going to live in the night or the day? It's your call. And your answer will determine your destiny. 
So take care. Let's pray. <clears throat> Let's spend a few moments of quiet as we reflect on God's word. Father, for those of us who feel so dirty and filthy, filled with shame and guilt, remind us that you came to wash people like us, that you shed your blood to cleanse us. Father, for those of us who do not see or feel our filth, we pray that you will give us no peace and no comfort until we realize how dirty we really are. So Lord, deal with us. Father, for those of us who are going through deep waters, who feel attacked by everyone, including the evil one, help us to remember that you are in control. And even though the hills should fall into the sea, God is sovereign. Father, be with us this week. Help us to serve you and to live for you wherever you've placed us. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen.